So we're going to go in three, two, one. Lions Lounge Lockdown, episode 16. John Goodman. John, thanks for joining us today. Absolute pleasure. Thank you. You've made me uh, make the transition over to Zoom. I hope this comes out and does it justice. <laughs> I'm a little bit worried, but I'm sure we'll be fine, mate. I'll take all the blame if it don't work. <laughs> Four years at Mirwall, 1990 to 1994. 109 games, 35 goals. You're um, a little bit of a, for the younger viewers that might be watching, a little bit of a 90s Jamie Vardy. You just sort of come out of nowhere at a non-league. Who's playing for, for um, who was you playing for originally? Well, two teams actually. Uh, Leighton Wingate, um, which I was there maybe two or three years with the manager, George Wakelin. And as you, even now it, within non-league football, when a manager moves, he tends to take a lot of players with him. Mm. And George had done 10 years of Leighton Wingate and done really well. Anyway, he goes to, to Bromley Town. He, li- he lived in, in, in Downham Way, just out around the corner. And he took me and a load of players with him. And he was very good with me, George. He, when we signed, I was a student at the time, uh, South Bank Polytechnic on the Elephant Castle there. And George said to the Bulls, um, I think John's got a chance of getting a pro contract at some point. So he's going to sign a contract, but that's only to give the club some protection around a transfer fee. Uh, but most importantly, if a club comes in for him, you're going to have to let him go. You know, so yeah, George was brilliant and, and true to his word. I, I kind of like literally played, did pre-season with Bromley. Um, played maybe three or four pre-season games, one against Mill uh, when Bob Pearson was, would happen to be there. And then the following Monday or Tuesday of that same week, we played against Leighton Orient. And I played really well. And uh, George told me before the game, he said, Did, you know, Mill will come in and watch you. You know, make sure you, you know, show plenty of enthusiasm, run around and hopefully you score a goal or two. And I scored two goals that day. And um, got a phone call the following day. I was, I was on a roof in central London with my dad, who's a glazer. And he had one of them brick mobile phones that was sitting in a party keg because he was, you know, was putting a big glass window on the Royal Academy of Art and he's on the roof. Um, so it was a bit nerve wracking. Anyway. And then his, his phone rings and it was George saying, come around the house, um, Mill were going to want to sign John. So, yeah, lovely. Went around there, met Bob Pearson and Bob was, again, phenomenally open and uh, fair with a contract. He gave me a year's contract. Uh, he said to me, you'll be in the first team by Christmas. Um, George negotiated upwards. So I went from 250 a week to 275 a week, Not which bad. was then, you know, was it? great from being a student to, to actually earning, you know, I was, I was heavily in debt. So I'd have taken anything they threw at me. Um, and yes, yeah, and then obviously, you know, signed a professional contract. So it was an amazing, amazingly, you know, fortunate experience to get into it a little bit later than most of my mates got into the game. Mm. Um, did you make your debut soon after? Uh, I, luckily enough, I mean, the, the truth of it was, I was, George converted me to a striker from, from midfield. Okay. So I was not a natural goal scorer. Definitely not, as the Millwall fans would probably tell you. Um, but I was a learner and I was a worker. So I, I, I got in, obviously played for the reserves early on. Um, but the game seemed easier at that level because I had better players around me that put the ball into better positions. And mm. I just, it just seemed to click. So as luck would have it, I played really well for the reserves. But I didn't score many goals, right? Okay. But they put me on the bench. Me and Kenny went on the bench very early on, I think around about September, October time. So really early on in my first season, I'm, I'm on the bench. Didn't get on the pitch. Um, but I think it was Bruce's way of maybe just dropping me and Kenny in for, for further down the line and giving us a taste for first team experience and the, the first team at that moment was on a, in a rich vein of form they were a very good team Teddy and Malcolm were playing up front mm. scoring I mean Teddy had an outstanding season throughout but the team played Alex Ray had just been signed and he was an outstanding midfielder outstanding prospect and combined with Jimmy Carter on the wing and you know still had uh, Les Briley playing the indoors mm. uh, Woody Keith Stevens at the right back you know it's a very experienced side that had just been relegated from the old first division so Anyway, I make my debut Boxing Day. So, so, so Bob weren't far away. It was a substitute got against Leicester. I think it was my first game and made my full debut New Year's Day uh, uh, Port Vale away. Nice. As we were saying, Bruce Rioch was the manager then. Um, an interesting one, Bruce Rioch. He came from Middlesbrough. He had a great eye for a player. He, he did sign a lot of good players um, yeah. for, throughout his time. Say Alex Ray was one of them, just to name one. But there was also, also a good mix, as you say, of the, of the squad that had just been relegated from the what would yeah. be now Premier League. So... How did you settle into that squad? There was a lot of, say, you had um, 
with Jimmy Carter, Les Briley, Dawes, Hawney, Kevin O'Callaghan, McCleary, Wood, Rhino and Teddy. Yeah, yeah. no, um, I'm from the same neck of woods as Teddy. So we, we'd actually been to the same school, albeit I think he's four or five years older than me. Mm. So Ted's, you know, he, he's got super confidence, you know what I mean? So when I met him for the first time, I'm like, wow, Ted, I went to the same school as you. And he's like, <laughs> he just <laughs> swatted me aside and put me back in my place a little bit. There was a... It, in, in a nice way, because I was just, um, listen, I've come from non-league, I'm a student, and now I'm at the training pitch, and there's Terry Erlock just before he goes to Rangers. Um, you know, it's Bruce Riock, the manager, there's Steve Harrison, the coach. It, it, it was just a little bit, you know, daunting, you know, to, mm. to, to, to put it mildly. I'm, it was I'm a very playing. quick transition, wasn't it, from... Yeah, you know, and the, the, what was great was, to, obviously, we all... We all um, the training down the New Elton Way. I can't remember the or I can't remember the name of the training facility. Bard Hill Sports, I think it was called, uh, around the back of Charlton's training ground. So, you know, we was all on the same site. It's, it's pre-season. You know, Malcolm Allen was really good with me. Watched me play over a few reserve games. Took me under my wing. Steve Harrison was amazing with me. He got me out every morning. He recognised I weren't a natural finisher. He had me half an hour before training, crossing and finishing on my own, not even a goalkeeper in the net, just practicing, heading, one-touch finishing and so on and so forth. So for a tough club, that I, you know, I played at Mill as a kid in a school cup final. We played against, um, I can't remember the school, but it was a couple of lads that were at Mill at the time, one being Darren Tracy, who was now in the, uh, in the reserves with me. And I remember playing at the old den, I think, bloody hell, this place is different. You know what I mean? Mm. It's not your football ground. It's three sides that are terracing. Uh, getting in and out of the place was always a, a challenge in terms of the archways and whatever else. So, mm. it, but it was underneath it, underneath the toughness, they were really good with me. And I'd seen the other side with Paul Goddard. And, and, and you know, Paul uh, was, you know, unfortunately for him, he, he'd come from Derby. I think he was, he'd sign, he was signed as a record signing to help the team stay up. Ex-West Ham, which never helped him whatsoever. No. And he probably wasn't a Millwall player. You know, and a lot of my... The lads at Bromley that I played with, they said to me, John, you, what you've got to do there, mate, you've you got to tackle, you've got to run, and you've got to be committed to, to that club, right? And I thought, well, I can do all of them things. There's things that Teddy can do and Malcolm can do as strikers that I just can't do at this moment in time. But what I will do is just work my socks off. And, mm. You know, what there was, was there was a, a tremendous platform. Like, if I'd have gone to a club... I think, looking back, as a non-league player with the rawness that I had, if I'd gone to a team that was struggling in, in Division 2, uh, I don't think I would have had a career because I wasn't... Like, what happened was Teddy enabled the whole team to function and enabled me to play mm. because I could do the things that he, he, he wasn't, wasn't in his game. You know, I'd, I'd, run the, I'd run the channels, I'd close down. You had some you had blistering pace as well. Yeah, and, 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 and he wasn't slow, but he was, he was measured with how he did things. Mm. And, you know, I remember training with him early on, and he was an outstanding technician. You know, he could strike the ball clean. He could head it perfectly. He could take the ball one touch, as could Malcolm. And so I was, you know, I, I, you know very much respectful of all the things they could do and just thought, well, i just got to work my socks off here and mm -hmm. endear myself to the, to the boys that way because I'm going to make mistakes. I'm not going to secure the possession as well as them. But, I was, you know, again, I was lucky. I scored a few goals, created quite a few for Ted in that season. We had a fair run of finishing up in the playoffs. Yeah, as I say, we, you just mentioned a few players there. We had the old, the old school that was sort of coming to the end of their Millwall tenure, the, uh, the, the legendary side. But then it's hard to remember down the years like a very out-and-out, -out attacking, exciting Mill team. But as we said, Malcolm Allen, Alex Ray, yourself, all going forward. Jimmy, Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter, well, well, again, he was electric quick. Um, the football was outstanding. I remember, yeah. you know, I, saw, I was signed, and Mick McCarthy must have been injured at the time. This was pre-season. I'm sitting in the stand, and we might have played a Scottish team. There might have been... I'm trying to think, it might, is it a full Kirk because Alex came from full or a Hibernian or someone like that anyway. It's a Scottish team we're playing pre-season. The pitch was beautiful. And you've got Teddy and Malcolm up front and they are not, you know, they, they just admit they're not the most mobile of, of, of runners. Mm. But they're into play and Alex running beyond them and Jimmy threatening down on one side of the wing. It was, you know, Bruce got something going there in terms of redefining how the team played. And fair play to him for that. 
Yeah, what was he like as a manager, Bruce Roll? Because obviously, it, it <laughs> didn't, yeah, I, I mean, I have heard, but I'll, I'll, ask, I'll ask your opinion. He, he was scary. He was scary. And um, I, I saw Bruce years later when he became manager of QPR and I was at Wimbledon at the time and he gave me a hug. And he, he, he was nowhere near as intimidating when I met him and he wasn't the same, didn't have the same presence, but he looked six inches shorter when I saw him further years later. Do you know what I mean? So I think one of the things, was, I was just daunted by his, he joined in training. Oh my God, he would boot the hell out of lads. You know what I mean? He had a, a, a he, he was a good player and if he was, he, you wanted to be on his team in a six side because if you weren't, he was coming for you. You know what I mean? So <laughs> um, he, 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 he was fierce, um, demanding, um, caring with me, you know, I remember him, uh, I got into the team, I did well, I then probably either lost my way a little bit or lacked a little bit of fitness or something. And we went down to Devon for a, a little break to lead into the playoffs probably. Mm. And he took me out in the evening on my own, just me and him, spent some time with me, spoke about stuff, did some additional running with me because he thought it improved my fitness. And it's probably just to build a bit of a connection. So he was caring, you know, he gave me my, my, my opportunity and he gave me a, a second professional contract. Mm. Um, but it was also moments where maybe he was frustrated with some of the behavior of, of, of lads. Um, there were some things going on that young men being young men, um, probably socializing a little bit too much in, in Deptford High Street. <laughs> and, uh, and there was some incidents that I think Bruce took exception to and, and they came out in the change room. Do you know what I mean? And it, 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 he had a, you know, I'm sure Malcolm would be comfortable talking about it. Maybe he has even spoke about it, but him and Malcolm had a ding dong at half time one game. And that was when I made my debut. He literally turned around and said, Right, you're going on and, and dragged Malcolm. Oh, what, because they had a row at half time. He said, "What well, if you come? John's going on." Yeah, off you come, John. You're going on. You know, and that was that was that was how I made my debut. You know, which was was you know, it's a dog eat dog professional environment. I'm <laughs> sorry, Mal. I'm in. You know, <laughs> yeah. I've got to make the best of this opportunity. Yeah, a million percent. So as we said, we made the playoffs that year. Um, yeah. So we've been relegated the season before for the top division. So we maybe was expecting to go back. But the players that we had, we've mentioned, we probably should have been looking to the first. Game at Brighton, you, you started that game, didn't you? I did. And probably if Jimmy Jimmy got sold to Liverpool in, in January, and possibly if Jimmy hadn't been sold, maybe that would have been maybe that would have been different. Maybe it wouldn't, I don't know. Mm. We fancied our chances against Brighton and we'd I think beaten them at home uh, comfortably. I don't know. I didn't plan the game away. I think they drew the game away. So uh, theoretically it, it was the right tie for us. Um, I started the game. We went a goal up. Paul Stevenson scored a goal, and it was it, was, it felt chaos down there. It just felt there was, it was fans running on the pitch. It was yeah. a real, you know, Intense. sharp atmosphere. Yeah. Te- yeah, it was. It was like it was. It's like a cup final. Although there was two cup finals to be played in, in terms right. of the playoffs. Yeah, yeah. Um, I then scored a goal, and it, I don't think it's even documented. But we had a free kick, and Steve O's fizzed this free kick in, and I just backheaded it, and it and it's gone in. So we're two 0 up. But the referee disallowed it for some... I didn't push anybody or nothing, right? But apparently he gave it for a foul. So it was a strange one. Then suddenly the game got stretched and, and they were just running through us. And they went, it went one all to 4-1 very quickly. Mm. I knew I wasn't playing that well, like in terms of the, the structure of the team had just started to fall apart a little bit. And whilst I felt I was probably contributing... It was probably right for John McGinley. John McGinley played the second leg. I, yeah. I wasn't, I wasn't surprised that I didn't start the second leg. I knew we had to win the game, you know, by three goals to nil. Um, John was a good finisher, you know, a good goal scorer, more experienced than me. I think he'd come on loan and then went back to his parent club and then eventually signed for us. But yeah, and uh, you know, we went a goal up, at the, uh, you know, at the den. Got Stevenson away on the left. Alex Ray's in the middle, needless to say, Sheringham's in there too, Dawes coming up to help him out, the cross comes in, and it might come to McGinley now, it's in there! The breakthrough that Millwall desperately needed has come from young John McGinley. Where was the Brighton marking? Just inside the far post. The delight as the Millwall player picks it out of the net. 
and we really have a cocktail on our hands now. But then they got away from us again. I think it just, I think what I learned from the playoffs during my time with, with Mill, because it happened a couple of times with us, mm. two or three times possibly, was that we, were, we, we had good teams, good league teams, and we could, you know, we, we'd grind out results. We'd, 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 we'd finish well in the league, but just didn't have that, that cup final. Big occasion. Yeah, it, it just had something different. I remember playing against Derby and Tommy Johnson and Marco Gabbiadini <laughs> playing incredibly well, two strikers for Derby, and they, 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 um, you know, they scored the goals that got them up. You know, it was the same with, with Brighton, really. Robert Codner running through, Mike Small up front. I remember him, you know, just the game got spread and got away from us. It was a real, you know, that, that, that journey home and then knowing you've got another game to play where really it's out of, out of our reach was, was tough. Mm. What was Rioch's reaction to the, uh, to the dismal disappointment at Brighton? I can't heads, remember. Did heads roll? No, it, it, it didn't because I think he, he, he wasn't of that type. He, he was, I think, I'm trying to think if, if Steve Harrison was still with us by then, whether Harry had left as well. So there was, there were, like Steve Harrison had, had, had left us at some point and that had also upset the, the, the dynamic of, mm. of the, him with, with the players. Harry was a, a great, you know, real, you know, real good coach in terms of connecting with people, but more importantly, had a, a wonderful sense of humour. Uh, look at diffuse situations that were bubbling away in Bruce's world. Do you know what I mean? Mm, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, when I, I, it's hard to remember when Harry left, I was, I was at the instant when it, when, when, when it all kicked off and Harry did leave. But oh, well, he, he, all, he left with uh, what, what was that over a row with Rio? Or was it? Oh, oh, I think I know. Oh, he, he, he had a he had a you'd have to probably do some research. I wouldn't want to do Harry a disservice, right? But he's got a, a, a party trick. I can't remember. Anyway, Steve, Steve was the, the England coach, so he, mm. he you know, he's tight with Graham Taylor. You know, we're really proud of, of, of what he's doing for England. He, great man. Uh, like I said, he, 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 he looks after me as well. Anyway, we were at Ipswich away. And it was, a, it was a Friday night in the hotel at Ipswich. Bruce had not travelled with us. He'd gone to watch a game elsewhere. So Ian McNeil, Bruce's assistant, was in charge of the group. And, uh, and, uh, and Harry is renowned for, you know, he'd, he'd fall down a flight of steps, you know, and you know, but knew how to land properly. You know, he'd... Walk over with a, a cup of tea in his hand and, and, and like drop the cup as if he's going to spit on your lap. But didn't have any tea in it. He'd <laughs> roll down, roll down a hill and fall into a lake as as we're walking for our pre-match hotel. You know, he he just did crazy stuff. You know, he, he was anything that would make you laugh. It's almost someone, someone laughed. He was happy, right? And yeah, he was yeah. A lovely, lovely guy. So anyway, this dude, we'd heard that he did this this particular trick that involves um, landing something uh, in a glass from a great height, right? That's coming out of his back passage. With so him. he, <laughs> so the lad's are like, Steve, you've gone all big time on us. You know, you, you're England coach now. You've gone all sensible. You know, when are you going to do your trick for us? You've heard all about it. I've heard you that. You've probably done it for England. Why haven't you done it for, the, for, your, for your team sort of thing? And he's like, all right, boys. He said, right, come to my room tonight. Give me a knock and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll reveal my party trick. So anyway, we finished dinner. We give it a little bit of time. I mean, you know, a few of our lads, we go, to, we knock on Harry's door. <laughs> he opens the door. He's got this towel wrapped around him as a cape. He's got a pair of underpants on his head and they look like goggles. And he ain't got enough, a lot on apart from that, right? And he's like, all right, lads, come in. It's the great, whatever the, the name of it was, you know, Supremo. He said, uh, there's a towel laid strategically under a wardrobe, right? And it's, oh, it must be the chest of George's. Anyway, he, we're all in the room. He shuts the door. He climbs onto this, chest of drawers and he's he's squatting and he's got his back to us and he's it's horrible right so anyway he's has a bit of a tease and tells a few jokes and suddenly <laughs> his breakfast lunch and dinner comes out <laughs> the glass is overflowing with you know oh. instrument we're all screaming because it's you know not the most pleasant thing but it's quite funny yeah. He then jumps down and he's like, da da! And he grabs the glass, he starts chasing after us. <laughs> so we all go running out the door and we're screaming, and it's, you know, probably making too much noise down the corridor. Anyway, walking around the corner is Ian McNeil, Bruce's assistant, and he's gone. So Harry's, cha <laughs> Harry's chasing us down the corridor. Bruce is, uh, Ian McNeil's coming the other way, and he's just shaking his head. He's like, what the hell are you guys doing, right? So we knew it was going to be 
serious. We played the game, uh, nothing was said. And then we got off the bus on the way back and it was obvious, I think Bruce got off the bus, spoke with Harry at the hotel where we, we dropped the cars off mm. and they had a conversation it. And then we was aware that you know, Harry had been sacked, you know. So, um, you know, Mick McCarthy you know, was a cap- club captain. So he wrote a letter. We all signed it. He went to the newspapers to try and explain that he's been sacked on nothing fraudulent, really. Something we encouraged him to do. He was, you know, he was entertaining us, really. But, mm. yeah, he lost his England job off the back of that as well. So it was a real, um, yeah, real shame that. So th- th- there was a time, you know, going back to why do I mention the story? It's because our connection with Bruce, Harry left. I, don't, I think Bruce started taking more training. I think Ian McNeil might have tried to. I don't think anybody else came. So it, Bruce was a shrewd guy. He, you're right. He's, he made some good signings. He, he signed Colin Cooper, who did very well for the yeah. club. He also didn't do some good signings that once with, with the Teddy money. You know, I think um, without be, again being disrespectful, that team off the back of the first season needed quite a bit of tinkering, and I think he needed to let players go and. Uh, he signed Mark Falco, John Colquhoun and, and, yeah. and, and a few others. And the team never really settled in. But in amongst all that was a Chris Armstrong who, who did amazingly well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, see, a, on my list, I've got Colin yeah. Cooper, Chris Armstrong, yeah. uh, Casey Keller came to the club, Ian Bogey, yeah. uh, Paul Kerr yeah. as well. Yeah, Nookie, Paul Kerr was... Uh, uh, yeah, Paul Kerr came in the first. Team. Paul Kerr was a very yeah. good footballer. Yeah, so he, he did. He, um, yeah, he, but I, I probably... I was always more connected to the coach or the manager that you felt um, showed a little bit more of a human side. Yeah. And um, so Bruce didn't work for me, but he, he would have worked for a Colin Cooper or he would have worked for, 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 for some of the other guys. You know what I mean? He, yeah. I think I found, you know, I found Bruce difficult. Yeah. I mean, do you think, I mean, obviously let's just move into the second season again, we've been, we've been in the, in what was the premier league for two years. We come down the first year, we make the playoffs just me, well, mm. and then just miss out in the playoffs. Second season, probably would have been expecting to do well again. Obviously, we didn't, and Bruce gets sacked. Mm. Um, started a, allegedly a player revolt by Mick McCarthy. As a younger player, that's just coming into to football for the first time. Maybe an older, an older head, a disciplinary is not so bad. But do you think the the more seasoned pro struggled with that a bit with Bruce's reign? I think that it was it was interesting. So one of the things was you weren't allowed to wear. Jeans. You had to wear trousers to to training. You couldn't be unshaven. You know there was trousers to training. Yeah, it, I think it was a thing that so Glasgow Rangers do it. Where you have to wear. I don't know if they still do, but you used to have to wear a suit to the, to the training ground. So you had someone like Terry Herlock, who um, was always unshaven um, and was a bit of a scruff bag, if we're honest, but was an outstanding footballer, fully committed to the club. It, it was. It, there was a little bit of stuff that was uh, again would be called Sergeant Majorish. Bruce would say it's, it's about it's, it's, it's creating discipline, mm. but it probably was a little bit overkill. Um, you know, that, that second season, I think we, what he had to replace was 38 goals that Teddy Sheringham scored, all right? right? And I remember in, I, so I'd played 20 games that season, scored five goals. Um, I was then 20 years of age. I'd, had a, I'd established myself as a bit of a first team player, but a first team player in a very good team mm-hmm. is not the same as a first team player where suddenly I've got to be the lead striker possibly. Um, Bruce called me into the office during the off season and said, listen, you need to look after yourself. I want you to be, be fit and ready for a pre-season. And I'm looking to you to, to establish yourself, you know, as, as our main striker. And I was like, yeah, no problem, Bruce. You know, great. I'm looking forward to the new season, but I probably wasn't ready. You know, I, I wasn't ready to be that player. And so, you know, early on in pre-season, he signed Mark, he's Falco, he signed John Cahoon, he signed Chris Armstrong. We still had Malcolm Allen, I think, at that moment in time. Mm. So there were a number of strikers there, um, but none of us were at 38 goals in us. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, 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 so then you like we had a lot around. of thinking players well, that around that time. Yeah, we did. And, but you can only play 11, and you, generally you only play 4-4-2. <laughs> four, four, and, you, you know, and so I think... Alex, I'm trying to think who else we might like. I'm not sure if Les Riley played so much the second season. Um, it was a team in transition. And you see it a lot. If you don't go straight back up from that you know, relegation, changes need to be made. And probably Bruce needed longer. The, the challenge was, was that I, I didn't feel there was 
I mean, I, I ended up being not really much involved with the first team, just maybe the odd substitute appearance, maybe around the squad, but I was more a reserve team player then and had gone back with Ian Evans and was playing reserve team football once more. So I was watching from afar. Obviously, how can I put it? Because it's a selfish business I'm in. Uh, I don't want to, I want the team to be unsuccessful because I want to get back in the team. Yeah, yeah, no. You know, and that, that's that's that. sadly, sadly how it is. And so I was looking at it. I remember me and Kenny went to a function with Mick McCarthy. And I think, I might have been on the bench. We went down to Portsmouth. We, we, got, we got beat by six, six, one, I think. I think Etienne Vivier might have scored. So Etienne was in the, around as well then. And there was posters and banners up saying brute, you know, sack Rioc, whatever else. So he, he clearly lost um, maybe some support from the fans as well. Yeah. Um, we went to his function anyway that week and Bruce was still in the manager at the time and, and Nick was talking about if he was the manager, what he would do and about what team he'd pick, whatever else. And he must have known what was happening because we went in a couple of days later and Mick had become player manager. Yeah. And he'd, he picked a team for that weekend and it was the team that he picked. So, yeah. I don't. I, I, obviously, I'm, I was a, a younger pro. I was removed from it. Definitely. What do you think that was? Why? Why had you been? So you come in, Rioc. Well, Bob Pearson signed you. Rioc gave you your debut. He took you. Mm. You know, when he when he felt he could help you out with fitness and had a little one on one with you. But then now, mm. by this point, you're back in the reserves. Was there? Obviously, there wasn't a falling out, or was there a reason? No, I think. Listen. Ultimately, he's got to win. He's got to win games, and I, you know, I've been. As I said, to you, I'm a learner. And I was learning on the job. I was learning the craft of finishing, not having been a natural striker as well. Mm. And he probably felt it was too much for me. And he, he, the, the results weren't great. I played, I played a couple of times up front with Chris Armstrong. That had gone okay. But, you know, he kind of two, unusual to have two, two 20 year olds playing uh, at that level. You know, Similar in, sort in of a, players as well, both, both pace. Yeah, yeah, exactly that. So he, he, he'd invested probably through in Mark Falco and, and John Cahoon. And, probably needed to give them some time to, to, to bed in, you know, but what was, was good for me was I was able to compare myself to, to Falks and, and to John and Chris and to Malcolm Allen and almost go, well, I'm not, I'm different to them, but I think I've backed myself given enough time. I, I, I can, I can get ahead of them again. So yeah. I, I knew it was a temporary thing. I knew I just wasn't, I wasn't Teddy sharing, you know, and, and we needed Teddy at that moment in time, or we needed, you know, or you, need, you needed a, a 20 goal a season striker that wasn't in our, in our, so he was trying to find, a, I guess, the team that would work for him. Paul Kerr was a good goal scoring midfielder, as was Alex Ray. Yeah. You know, but it, it, what, the goals weren't in the side and it, when you're not scoring, suddenly the, the, the team, you can see the goal, they get a little bit anxious and suddenly we're losing games that probably we shouldn't have done. Yeah, so uh, he loses his job. Mick McCarthy takes over. Uh, for you, obviously, again, a younger player, that probably wasn't a, a massive deal. But maybe do you think, I mean, Mick succeeded at me all for a few years, but do you think maybe some of the old, older players, again, that have been Mick McCarthy's teammate in the dressing room, did, how did Mick cope with, with the transition to becoming manager? Did he, did he sort of cut ties with players or was he still around it? Because that can't be easy, yeah. can it? No, he was good. He was really good. And what, 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 the, the, the partnership was him and Ian Evans. So, Taffy took training. Mick would often join in training. Mick would focus our minds because, again, he would, <laughs> he would go right through the back of me. You know what I mean? He would not muck about in training. And he, his eyes would pop out of his head and the veins would be going in his neck and he'd just be like, oh, my God, I better. If I'm in his team, I better perform. If I'm against him, I need to be on my toes because he's coming for me. You know what I mean? So yeah. it was brilliant because he, he raised the tempo of training again. And we, had, we all had enormous respect for him. And we all, or definitely we all, it felt like a, the, there was a better chemistry with, 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 with Taffy leading training than, than, than Bruce leading training. Mick was dead straight, you know, really early on, you know, put me in the team, said, listen, you're going to make mistakes, you're going to miss opportunities, I'm going to give you a run, just, 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 just go with it, you know I mean, just do your best. And so in the first game I played up front with Malcolm Mallon, he was very encouraging, Malcolm scored a goal, I think we might run the game one, you know, I missed a couple of chances, but I didn't feel... So threatens the fans. Let me know I was missing chances. So you know, I'm aware. That, no, but that's yeah, that's yeah. You, you, you've got to grow to accept that, you know. And so I knew I had to improve, um, but I was back in the team. We finished the season pretty okay, and then what was great was we was they, they then really gave it some thought about the style of play again that we'd like to do. Tinkered with the team somewhat for that for their first 
new season and we went for Diamond, which suited myself, suited Chris Armstrong, suited Malcolm Allen and, and also Ian Bogie, who was a, a super technician who could play behind the front too. So, yeah, it, it, it really came together. I think they just felt they got the right formula for the players they had. Yeah, let's talk about, sorry, before we move on to the, the next season, which was the last season at the old den, can we talk about just what the characters of those players, um, Ian Bogey, Paul Kerr, obviously, and Etienne Vivere came to the club. Do you remember Etienne mm. coming into the club for the first time? I do. I do remember Etienne. I mean, I remember really early on, and I, again, I, this is my naivety, really, in terms of coming from non-league. I, did, I, I, I trained to the best of my ability, but wouldn't necessarily... I, I wasn't that coachable, I don't think. You know what I mean? I wasn't, a, a t- you know, I wasn't tactically astute. I just yeah. saw what's in front of me, run after it, or try and score a goal. You know, didn't understand the more subtleties of the game. Etienne comes from Holland. He was, you know, technically not great, but he was, you know, he, he, was, he, he spent half an hour before training stretching. He spent half an hour after training stretching. He was conscious about his diet. He would take his fitness training seriously. He wouldn't piss about in training. Whereas I'd be having a bit of a joke with what the other lads during training and he'd be like, come on, Goodman, concentrate. And we used to laugh at him as like, what the f- what's up with him? Fuck off, Etty. You know what I mean? Who are you? E.T. E- e- we used to fuck off, E.T. You know, but he was, he was here. He was serious. He wanted to, you know, improve and have a career in the game. And, you know, it's only years later I realised, bloody hell, I, I kind of was a bit, I, I didn't, I was professional and I wasn't yeah. unprofessional with my anx- actions, but I wasn't really... That we trained, yeah. we, was, we did what we were told to do, we went on. You know what I mean? I wasn't... The European culture was, they was those years ahead, wasn't there? And that's uh, what I probably brought yeah, over. I was thinking, fuck off, E.T., but then... Yeah. It, he was, was never... You like, doing what was the norm in England at the time, wasn't well, you? Well, really we had a great chemistry. Like, I remember Keith Stevens, Rhino, Alex Ray, Malcolm, Andy Roberts, myself. Mm. Other lads would jump in, you know, Brian Orn, whoever, you know, whoever it happened to be, you know? We would have regular nights out, Zen's nightclub in Dartford. I remember going to quite regularly. And we, on a Tuesday afternoon, we'd always go into the, the Gregorian pub, which is just around the corner of, not, uh, not the Greg, no, uh, what's B. it I. called? Yeah, B.I. for the B.I. Still there. B.I. Yeah, around the corner from the training ground. And go, we, it, it was, we'd go B.I. Chinese, Chinese B.I., one or the other, then into the West End. And uh, Rhino had found this drink called the Baltimore Zoo that TGI Fridays uh, served. And it was like a cocktail and a pint, or a cocktail and a, and a bottle of Budweiser. And you put your bottle of beer in this cocktail. Oh. My God, it was like fucking rocket fuel. So, so but it, you know, but again, it was, it was, we, we created a chemistry. We, 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 we trained hard. We'd do our fitness work on the Tuesday. We'd have the Wednesday off, so we'd sleep off our, our excesses. Um, and, you know, we, it, it, I guess really fun times, really. It, it was, yeah. it's, and lucky enough to be in a, in a, in a team that was, that was pretty decent. You know, we was always threatening uh, playoffs, but, but, we're not far away, actually, from being a top two, top three side as well. Yeah, the, the, another player I want to ask you about is is Paul Kerr. There was, mm. just, I, just, I love nineties. I mean, I love football now, obviously, but it, yeah. it just will never compete with the nineties. I don't think just just the things that happen and just random things happen. Like Paul Kerr came to the club, was our top scorer that season, scored fourteen mm. goals in forty four games, and then left for Port Vale. What? The, no what idea why. I, I, I mean, did he not settle down south? I don't know. I, I think it, there was there it was must that. have been I, something like that. He, he came on loan my first season and I was getting a bit leggy, you know, again, you know, so I was, I was adapting to first team football, which is physically very demanding. I was, Teddy used to say, well, John, just breathe, just breathe. And it's really hard to just breathe when you're blowing out your ass. You know what I mean? But he so, so came in and he was kind of like a, a hybrid player. He was a midfielder that could play up front. He could play left midfield. He, he, but he had a real life for goal. And mm. I remember him coming in one of the first games, Leicester away. I think Ted, we, we might have won the game, but we call him Nookie, Nookie Bear for some reason. He looked like Nookie Bear. He come off the bench and I just thought, wow, he's a really good technically gifted player, this guy. Mm. you know. And again, he was a lovely lad. Um, you're right, that next season, wherever he played, he scored. He just, I, I don't think he could settle without knowing much about it. I just remember thinking, yeah, you're right. He was a, he performed really well in a team that didn't function particularly well that season. Yeah. Um, I don't know, you know, of all the clubs to go to, Port Vale doesn't sound like, you know, the, the, the best option he, he could have had. Well, but especially if you, if you come to a, a top side that's yeah. up there in the championship or compete in the yeah. championship, you do well for them. You don't then leave to go to League Two Port Vale. No, it's it, yeah. It, it, I think it could possibly have been as well. I think obviously Mick had become the manager. So there was some, 
there, there was always some financial challenges for, for Mill as a club, mm, you know, and true. particularly was going to new stadiums. So I think maybe I'm looking back, John Cahoon went back to Scotland, I think. I think Mark Falco probably would have got released. Um, so Paul might have been one of that, 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 that group of players that maybe was on a, a different salary band to everybody else. So they just maybe needed to let him go. Um, mm. Yeah, so it was. It was. It was a shame because he was a lovely fella as well. He, had a, he, he very. He, he ended up being a, a PFA rep for a while. So he was a very caring guy. You know, he's, he's, a, he's a good. Mm. Look, looked after me. You know, again took me under my, his wing and gave me his his, his knowledge. Um, but yeah, it was it, it was a strange move back to Paul Vale. Yeah, it was a strange one. Also, we had, so we had um, Ian Bogey, we'll get on to in a minute, because mm. I want to discuss a certain goal you scored and something you did. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you did look at me. Um, <laughs> yeah, like him, Malcolm Allen and Paul Kerr, I remember them all being great players as a kid. They were all very similar sorts of players, wasn't they? All attacking. Yeah. I mean, Malcolm Allen... Well, Malcolm was, was yeah. a more, more of an out-and-out striker. Malcolm had a good eye for goal, whereas mm. Ian Bogey, if, if Ian Bogey could score, you know, he would have had a, you know, an even greater career. He... he it's interesting how he ended up coming to us because I think he was labelled the next Paul Gascoigne, you know. So he played in the team with Gascoigne and Paul Stevenson. Uh, I think they were Paul Stevenson, together. yeah, Geordie, you know. So the between, you know, and, and again, he had a great sense of humour. Bo, he, he he did Elvis one Christmas, you know, in a fancy dress, and I was Elvis because I was Elvis. The fans yeah, called you me Elvis, Elvis, didn't they? Yeah. But I rocked up as Elvis, and Bogues is also Elvis, but he's a better Elvis than I am, you know. And <laughs> so yeah, he, he was a you know again good lad, funny. Um, a great feeder, provider uh, for opportunities. So he played behind the front too. Um, again, not as selfish. I say Paul Kerr was more selfish, bogey. So Paul Kerr would score the goals, but was not the out-and-out goal scorer that Malcolm Allen was. So there was three different players that covered, you know, a really interesting, you know, could be perceived as luxury players, possibly for a club like Mill, you know, like you know, the mm-hmm. traditional type of Mill player. You wouldn't, they're, they're very creative, very brave, uh, to, to to receive the ball and put the ball at risk and you know and you know f- to, to accept that things ain't always going to go their way you know and, and to mm. accept that maybe the fans will get on it then when it's not going their way but they'll get it right often enough to turn the fans back around again yeah so the 1992-93 season um, was the last season at the, at the old den yeah the ones that came in you said that they like to go for a diamond Andy May was brought in as a sort yeah. of in front of the back four Jamie Morley Came yes. in for Chris Armstrong when just after the season started. But on top yeah. of that, a terrific amount of youth that came through. Andy Robertson made his uh, yeah. debut the previous season. He also joined in the first team, uh, amongst others, by Kennedy Beard and Ben Thatcher. Um, yeah. yeah I don't know if Tony to... Dolby might have had a little bit yeah. of an introduction yeah. at that stage as well. So, good, good little additions there. Good little additions. Jamie Morley, what was your first... You, you, had, you, you went on to have a little bit of... Um, a good relationship with Jamie. And off the pitch, you know. Um, again, I learned a lot from Jamie. The, 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 the backstory being, I remember, um, so Chris Armstrong got signed the previous season from, from Wrexham. I remember we played pre- Wrexham pre-season friendly. I'm up front playing for Mill. Chris is playing for, for Wrexham and, and he, he tore us apart, to be honest. You know, he didn't score, but he tore us apart. And you know, it was no surprise we signed him, right? So, you know, I got on really well with Chris, you know, and, we'd go out and enjoy ourselves around town. And, you know, I think Taffy used to call us Pepsi and Shirley. I don't know what I was in some band, I think Pe- Pepsi and Shirley. So he, he, that was me and Chris's uh, nickname. And obviously Kenny would, would tag along as well. Um, but remember being pre-season that 92, 93 season, we go to Ireland, uh, mix the manager. He's a legend in Ireland. And me and Chris are sharing a room. We don't, you know, we're training, we're preparing for the season. And me and Chris are like, like you know, in our beds before one game, he's going, Cool. Can you imagine getting a transfer for a million quid? Can you imagine earning a thousand pound a week? Can you, you know, we're just talking about stuff that yeah, you know, yeah. possibly outside of our dreams, you know, but just what we things you're you're aiming at as, as young lads. Anyway, he has an outstanding preseason. Gets into the team ahead of me. I played a few games in preseason alongside. I remember we played Wimbledon preseason, and we both played really well. And I think Wimbledon were, were, were then looking at him uh, to sign him. I think. We started the season and I might have been on the bench and, and, and Malcolm, Chris was up top with maybe John McGinley. I, don't, I, can't, I can't remember, but I know, I'll, and the team, would, Chris was playing really well. Malcolm was, was playing well. We were scoring goals. Next thing, Chris Palace made a million pound signing. Chris Armstrong, gone. A thousand pound a week. <laughs> 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 so, 
he was delighted you know he's, he's got the million pound move he's got his thousand pound a week and i was but what happened in return we got chris uh, sorry we got jamie morley yeah and again jamie came in and here's this guy he's uber confident you know what i mean he's like strutting the stuff and um got a swagger proper south london lad you know he he, he kind of like had a gift of the gab got a lovely turn of phrase funny funny guy you know got all, all the rhymes everything's got a rhyming slang to it yeah, yeah. um and I couldn't quite make him out because he, he didn't look the quickest. He didn't look technically the strongest. But he fucking kept scoring. <laughs> and, and again, I think, well, I'll tell you what, Mick had signed John Byrne. He signed John Byrne from Sunderland. And, and, and Budgie had scored a stack of goals the previous season in an FA Cup run for Sunderland. And, you know, again, you think, bloody hell, what a good signing that is. So I think John Byrne and, and Jamie were playing up front and I was back on the bench watching. But I'm looking at things. I'm better than Budgie. I'm backing myself here and I'm better than Jamie. But I haven't shown it to Mick yet. You know what I mean? He's given me a chance. I haven't quite done it. Jamie's come in. He's hit the ground running. And so, yeah, they would, they would, it was good because it was competitive. I remember going to knock on Mick's door and saying, Mick, you know, I've, I've played for the reserves. I've played 10 games. I've scored 10 goals. I've, I've got it sus now. I'm ready. You know, you've got to put me in the team. And that was like, I'm not arrogant like that normally. You know, but I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm ready now, Mick. And fair play, Mick's door was always open. And he'd go, okay, Elvis, bear with me. I'll give you a chance, we, you know, as and when. As luck would have it, John Byrne weren't doing that well. He weren't, I don't know if he had a carrying an injury or, or something. He hadn't really settled into the team. And I, I got back in the side, maybe it might be Newcastle away or early, you know, around Christmas time. Mm. Played well, then scored, again, I think, against Tranmere over Boxing Day over that period. And... I started scoring more regular goals. So I went from scoring maybe one in four, one in, one in five, to maybe one in three, one in two. And ended up going on a real good run with Jamie, matching him each other goal for goal. Yeah. I went on a really good run. I think we beat Brentford six, we beat Peterborough six, I think, as well. Mm. We was you know, free scoring for a while. And it's a really, really enjoyable team to play in. You know, I, I love playing at the old den. I'd love playing in the team with Ian Bogey, just you know, giving us chance after chance. I love scoring goals. I've, I've grown to love that, and you know, it was really happy times. You know, and it was a good team. Yeah. So we spoke. We spoke to Jamie, and, and we put a clip in his video. We might even put it on this one again, where he scores the first against Leicester at the Old Den, um, and then he puts it on a, a brilliant crossing for you. You head it back across yeah. for two 0 yeah. Build it and roll in. You jump up on the uh, railings. <laughs> Bogacino comes and, and whips your shorts down. You didn't look happy. You did not look happy. <laughs> I didn't know what was going on, and I wasn't sure how. Where was my shorts, my pants? What 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 was what was being bared? All I just it, it, that was just a bogey moment. To be fair, again, you know, I, I weren't great in the air, and so it was it was a great cross from Jamie, and it, it was a, a bit of a flying header. So I was just so relieved and delighted to to, to score a diving header like that. Yeah. Yeah, he's a <laughs> it, it, it was a moment, yeah, not one of the finest. Yeah, if Netflix could kill, mate, he was like, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah. It's these bushy eyebrows, you see. It probably looks worse. And, <laughs> I didn't mean nothing by it. Um, so we mentioned, I mentioned them just quickly there, but um, the younger players that came through that season, obviously, you must have been, you would have been aware of the brilliant youth side they had. Yeah. And then they came in, Beard, Kennedy and Thatcher obviously made the biggest impact of those that came in. Uh, again, I think what we were able to do was give them confidence that if we can play in first-team football, they'll be able to play first-team football. I mean, to be fair, Ben Thatcher, not short of confidence. Mark Kennedy, not short of confidence. You know what I mean? They, and, and, and nor Andy Roberts, you know. There, there, there was, I think, you know, it was a funny thing. I was maybe 21, 22, so I'm suddenly looking at myself as one of the more experienced players. Yeah. In terms of, I've been at the club for two or three seasons now. I'd settled in in terms I felt comfortable having a uh, you know talking football having conversations with, with Rhino and, and the more senior members of the, the, the first team playing squad as well Alex Ray Malcolm whoever so I felt an established first team player at that moment and our job was to help them you know in terms of the Tony Dolby's the Andy Roberts not that they needed much help you know they, they helped the team they they gave the team energy they gave us even more identity about what the club's about mm. um, and we'd run as hard as we could for each other to, to help each other, you know, and, and, and support each other. You know, it was, it was real, you know, good connection throughout. And, and like, you, I don't, you mentioned Tom Wally. I mean, you know, Tom was the youth team coach. Mm. He used to give me bollockings when I was playing for the first team. You know, <laughs> if I weren't, if I didn't look strong enough, if I weren't aggressive enough, if I didn't run hard enough, he would come and 
down to me like a ton of bricks. So it was lovely. We had this, this thread running through the club of, of care, you know, yeah. from Tom to Tav to Mick to the medical team to the players themselves. You know, it was a real tight bunch. Mm. You've mentioned him and you spoke highly of him so far. Let's get on to him before we move on to the, because he leaves the club, it's his final season. Malcolm Allen, mm. what was he like as a character? Uh, he, he taught me a lot, Malcolm. Um, good and bad. Uh, he, <laughs> he, no, he, uh, that's unfair in some ways, but I've never had a curry before I met Malcolm Allen, right? And probably never got so drunk before I met Malcolm Allen as well. He, considering this, right? So I've come, I'm a kid, I'm 19 years of age, and he's, you know, he's the first team in the first team with, with Teddy. And there's a bust up with Bruce. So now he's not in the team and now he's substitute. And I'm in the team. The easiest thing in the world for Malcolm Allen would be to make my life difficult because yeah. he knows that you know, I'm fragile because I'm, I'm learning on the job. He was so supportive. He was brilliant. You know what I mean? And he would, we'd go out, I'd meet him, Alex, John McGlashan. They all lived uh, together at times in Deptford High Street. I lived the others, uh, across the road in Deptford. We'd hook up. Malcolm would take me for a curry. Every 15 minutes, a beer would arrive. I'd have to drink it. But like by half past 10, I'm stuffed, I'm drunk. And then we've got to go out down the old Kent Road and drink even more. So he was just, you know, uh, he, yeah, it was, it was fun. He was, it, we, we used to travel together a lot because he then moved out to Watford with, with his family. Um, and we'd sometimes meet at a hotel. We'd travel to the games together. He'd give me advice. He'd give me a bollocking. He'd be like, how are you letting Chris Armstrong get in the team above you? You ain't fucking scoring enough goals. You know, he, he was caring. Mm. Really early on, he, he watched me play against uh, against West Ham in a reserve game, and I missed two or three chances. And he called me the following day, sat me down on the on the steps at the, at the training ground. He said, "John, you know you're doing great. You, you know you really you're getting chances. That's brilliant. Don't worry that you're missing them. It, it will come. You know." And I was really, you know, um, I say it, it, I've never seen a lad control the ball as well as Malcolm Allen. And Teddy had a good touch, right? But Malcolm's touch was off his chest, off his either foot. He could hang in the air. He was aggressive in the air. You know, he, he was a top, top, top footballer. I enjoyed, enjoyed his time. I enjoyed working with him. Let's get back to you said we was flying. And Jamie Morley, we spoke to last week, said the same. We, we, you know, we, we looked now. Well, if you'd have asked at Christmas, we'll, we'll, we'll get promoted. You probably said, well, possibly, but playoffs at the minimum. But we fell away, didn't we? Just towards the end and end up missing out by, by one space. We finished seventh. Yeah. Do you know, know what that was in your mind? Oh, you know... It's hard to remember why. I'd have to look at the fixtures and look at the run of games to try and. To we try went, and recollect. The new dem was was be, was been built and it was our last season. So maybe yeah. the, I don't know the distraction of the new the new ground impending or something. I don't know. I think that, that, that there's there's it, and it probably it's, it's a bit of a cliche, but it happens a lot with 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 young sides that we probably didn't e distribute our performances out evenly across the season. We had real hot spots, you know, where we're probably scoring more goals than we should score, you know, and we're, we're running away with games or we're, we're, we're winning comfortably, you know, and, and we're, we're almost burning ourselves out, getting the fifth or sixth, whatever. And, it, and then probably when it, I, I think there was a, a game against Newcastle at home, we possibly needed to win and we, we might have drawn that. And um, I know we, we lost Bristol City, I think, at home. We, we, we'd lost one and we drew again, or, you know. There was probably just momentum getting away from us and there wasn't that game craft knowledge to, to lean on. You know, it was a young team. Finally, I've, I've got to say... You didn't have all the experience maybe just get games no, open line sometimes. But you, you, you'd say at the start of the season, if, if you'd looked at the squad and the, the youthfulness of it, to finish seventh in, in, in the championship would have been a... Yeah, we'll take that. You know, that's a good achievement. I know we've got a little bit of experience with Andy May or whatever else, but, you know, it was a... It was a team off the back of the previous season that hadn't done very well at all, you know. So to to achieve what what was achieved, albeit we weren't that far away from uh, playoffs or or even automatic at one point, yeah, we just lacked that little bit of experience probably. What was he like, Andy May? Morally said that Andy May was was the first name on the team sheet. Really good player. He sat in front of the back four, if I remember right, and it was like defensive midfield. Yeah, he was the the. In the use the word sensitively, the lubricant, you know, the, 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 the guy that made things work, you know, he just would receive comfortably under pressure. You know, we was always about building play, um, but still having a, a threat with myself and Jamie running forwards. 
Um, great manner, great manner. Um, yeah, again, good. Not the captain, but a leader on on the pitch. Uh, mm. We knew he was not tight with Mick, but he must have played at Man City with Mick. So there was a connection there. He had a steady voice. He'd make mistakes. It didn't phase him. You know, he, if we made mistakes, it didn't phase him. Just get on the next thing. Get on the next thing. You know, so yeah, I, I, there were some good players in that team. I, I, I think, you know, Kenny Coops. I think Casey must have been in the side by then mm. as well. Generally, teams are made. You know, it's the backbone that, that gets the team going. Andy, uh, the, the base for Alex Ray again, having probably an excellent season, probably would have chipped in with a number of goals. Yeah. You know, there were some good players in there. Um, that the, the, the base was right, you know, in terms of the back four as well. The last game at the old den. Mm. What's your memories of that day? I was injured. Uh, it was not a great game. It was really hot from memory. I was labouring. I'd, I'd done my groin. But I wanted to play in the last game at the den. Yeah. And I think the game had a, I think it hadn't meant anything. I think we, we, it's unlikely we was going to get involved yeah. in the playoffs. So I, I bluffed it really in terms of declaring myself fit for the game. Um, I think we lost 3-0. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was... Uh, all I remember is Casey having his pants torn off as he's trying to sprint in, into the tunnel. I remember, the, the, I think that there was a corner and it must have been an attacking corner. So Casey must have been in the goal at the far end. As you know, the, the, the old den, the tunnels right by the, uh, the, the, the terrace in there, so the, the, at the far end, yeah. So the referees give everyone a nod, right, we're going in. You know, we're going to take the corner, a blow whistle, we're all running in. So Casey's probably on the halfway line by this point. So corner gets kips, blows the whistle. <laughs> There's fans on the pitch. They've they're, they're got the corner flag. They're in the goal already. They're swinging on the crossbar. They're tearing up the turf, you know, getting mementos. <laughs> We're all sprinting in. I look around. Casey is just like naked. <laughs> and he's a strange dad anyway. You know, very uh, strong American accent. I'm not quite sure where he's from in America. He, you know, he was Captain really. Sensible. Very sensible, uh, wasn't he? Yeah, he's a you know, very patriotic guy. And you know, probably would, if he had a gun, would have shot a few people probably. But <laughs> yeah, he's just uh, yeah. It was it was a it was a, it was, a, it was a, not the right way. And there was a selfishly again. There was a slight caveat for me. I think I'd scored. The previous game then against Charlton, we'd won one nil. So my personal claim to fame was I was the last Millwall player to score at the den, albeit I wasn't the last player to. So I'd always, in some ways, relieved that no one else scored because I never, you know what I mean. But it was, yeah. it was not the way you want to end uh, the, 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 the old den. No. So then we moved to the new den. Do you remember obviously the excitement, the buzz around the club? I do, and I I, I do remember. Um, Pre-season, and I, I, I think off the back of the injury, off the back, I think I had surgery in that summer, so I, I missed uh, the start of the season and absolutely being gutted. I think we had Rio Sociedad came over, was it, for the opening game. John Toshak brought a team over. Um, I think John Toshak. Probably oh, lost, you, I can't in Lisbon, was it Lisbon? Sport, sorry, Sporting Lisbon. Sorry, Sporting Lisbon. Sporting Lisbon, yeah. Louis Fink, and, like that, yeah, um, I was in hospital. So I, oh. I kind of like... Uh, was not, I was so excited with the new den because it looked a cracking stadium um, and, you know, it was all desperate to play there. But it wasn't my time at that moment. You know, I was in hospital recovering. Uh, I think we'd, we'd started, okay, uh, I can't remember, I don't know if we, actually, I think it was the first game South End? First league game. But yeah, the, yeah, we lost, I remember losing 4-1 at the South End. It was, yeah, I remember, that day, well, I, remember, I remember sat in the stand watching that and as, as funny enough, I, I grew up with Jason Lee, who um, we, grew up, we grew up on his, yeah, no, he was the oh, striker, the pineapple, uh, pineapple head, right, sorry. He, 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 he smashed Rhino early on, Rhino had, <laughs> went off, had blood coming from his head, got, the, got the, 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 the strapping back on his head and it was horrible, it's one of them games where you're sitting there, this is not what we want our stadium to be about, you know, we want to be the team dominating and, and beating people up and winning 4-1, you know, but they were a scruffy side south end, it was difficult, you know, and Barry Fry had gotten going, but yeah, it was, I, 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 I love the old den, because you could have 8,000, 9,000 fans there, mm -hmm. and it was still so atmospheric, you know what I mean, it, you could hear the fans, you could, a, 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 a midweek game at the den under the lights, wow, the old den, phenomenal. Mm -hmm. The new den, equally inspiring in different ways. You know, I mean, it's our patch, it's our stadium, it's the statement, um, great pitch. Um, and again, we had a good team, you know, and so I was so excited to play there. 
Right, sorry, getting back to the 93 94 season. Yeah. First season of the New Den, your last season at the club. Um, you last were, full season. Yeah, last full season. Last full season, sorry, yeah. at the club. Um, yeah. The first player ever, you said the last Millwall player to score at the Den, the old Den, he was the first Millwall player ever to score a hat trick. Yeah. At the New Den. That's okay. Yeah, I'll take that. I, yeah. that then when I, was today. I thought he was going to correct me, so I was wrong. <laughs> No, I was thinking the first goal scored. I think, well, I know what. Yeah, John, Kerr, John Kerr got yeah, the first one in the Friday, but you got right. the first yeah. hat trick. Um, you've been injured, yeah. came back, started right. against Watford 4 hmm. 1. Funny um, day. Um, it's, it's, and it's funny that it's, I'm, well, so it's probably 25 years ago that it's still so vivid, um, as is every game. You know, it's a fun, you know, you just such great memories, but they're embedded in, in your head. But yeah, on that occasion, I was unaware I was starting. Um, the team weren't. Scoring, I knew I was working my way back to fitness. I'm going to get my chance at some point. I didn't, I didn't knocked on mixed door or done anything like that, but I thought, okay, I feel pretty ready. My usual pre match meal would have been a beans on toast type thing, but I'm thinking, because I'm sub, I'm going to have a bacon sandwich today and I have an extra cup of tea and I might even have a sausage with it, whatever else. You know, and I'm going to go to town today because I'm only going to get on for 10, 15 minutes, whatever. <laughs> get to the stadium and, and mix like, oh, Elvis, got to have, got to have two minutes with you. Huh? Um, you're starting. I said, oh, someone must have been injured. I can't remember who it was. Anyway, someone's injured. No problem. And it said it was one of them. It just, I, I, I watched it back on YouTube the other day, actually. The, the goals were two, two laid on. Yeah, I, I wasn't bad with my left foot, to be honest. It was one of them I could swing it and it would, it would connect. And the first one probably was a little bit more difficult than it looked because it was, I had to hook it uh, from, from behind over my shoulder. But yeah, I think we hadn't scored for a little while. So there's, the, Phil Barber's giving me a big hug and there's a lot of relief that we've got to go. And the second one, God knows what the lad was doing. He's, he's 20 yards from goal, trying to chest it back to the goalie. And he was hopeless anyway. So he said, oh, technically, what are you doing? And I, I remember that. It's probably one of the better goals that I scored. Cause I didn't score great goals, really. But that one, it flew, in, flew into the far corner. And when you're on two, and I'd, I'd scored two a few times without getting the third. So... I was lucky enough that it was a great, great ball from um, Richard Huxford, I think it was. Yeah, it and, was, yeah. Yeah, just the goalie, thankfully, is committed and got it, got it past him. And empty net, you're not, not going to get an easier you know, opportunity to score a hat-trick than that. So, yeah, real nice feeling. Um, yeah, very proud moment. Did you, have you started to attract the attention at this point from other clubs? Or what point did you, not, did you first start to think the like, clubs are watching you? Are and... I think... we. We was aware that the club was always in a cycle of having to sell players, you know, unfortunately. And we had uh, a number of agents that tended to work around our club. So would target us. And I'd had conversations with one of the agents who, he, I think they say it to, 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 to looking back, probably to, to, to massage your ego. Oh, Norwich have come in for you, but the club have said no, but don't worry, I'll let Norwich know that you're in, you know, you, we can maybe do something further down the line. I'd be like sitting there going, okay, well, you know, if that, that's the case. No. I don't know. I, you know, the thing about football now, and pro- but pretty more so then was there was a lack of openness or, or communication, you know. So if a club had made a bid, you might have seen it in the newspaper, but Mick would not be at liberty to let me know that a club had made a bid for me and you know, I was under contract to the club. So, yeah, I was aware, but I wasn't. I was in no rush, you know. I, I was absolutely loving my football. I was getting paid to do something we enjoyed, um, and I felt I was still had quite a bit to learn. You know, I didn't think I was anywhere near as accomplished as, as someone like Teddy that I've played with. Mm-hmm. I thought, you know, that, that that's that's the level. You know, that's the level of strike. If you're going to go and play in the Premier League or higher up, that's the level you're going to be aspiring to. Mm, a good season for you. A good season for the club. So we finished third. Let's talk about a few other games that season. The uh, the massacre of Crystal Palace at home on Boxing Day needs to be definitely mentioned. Yeah, that was. And again, Chris Armstrong was playing for Palace, and again, I was I was tight with him, and it was nice because he he he'd done it. He'd had a season in the Premier League, Chris, and, and, and done well. Although Palace got relegated, he'd shown he could score goals in the Premier League. And again, I was thinking, okay, Chris can do it. I might be able to do it as well. But we. Again, was on a great run. Uh, it was. It felt like it was under lights, but it must have been a three o'clock kickoff. I don't know, but it, it felt there was a very atmospheric again. And yeah, it's Boxing Day, so it's pretty. Yeah, it's it was, it was, the picture in it. it's freezing yeah. cold. I had a chance in the first half, I remember, and I run round it. So rather than use my left foot, 
I opened myself up and tried, and it's just one of them too precise, no disguise on the finish. And, you know, Nigel Martin made a good save, but I was gutted about that really because I felt it was a better chance than, than, than what I, you know, I should have taken it really. Yeah. Anyway, um, I can't remember, was, I don't know, I can't remember just the scoring sequence. I can tell you this is onside, Ray is onside. He's got the ball through to Vivier, can he turn? Brilliant. Just needs that cross and he's managed it, he's going to be in there, it is, it's Goodman! Another Millwall corner and uh, Palace are up against it now. Up goes Stevens. Vavia hits the crossbar. Is it in? It is. It is. I think Vavia will claim that one for himself. Brilliant piece of uh, skill from the Millwall number eight. The league leaders being beaten. Alex Ray, Goodman, scorer of the first goal. Can Mitchell turn? He was pushed out. It's a penalty. It's a penalty and Millwall got the chance to go three ahead. Which he does. Alex Ray has done it's a fantastic time for Millwall. I look back and I think, I remember it at the moment because I didn't connect to it properly. And thankfully, it's one of them where you're that close to the goal, just by heading it down, the goalie almost tried to read what's going on and they dive out of the way. It's, yeah, yeah. it's, 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 it's a, a relief moment. Because um, I was always conscious that I'd miss as many as I'd score. And there's nothing so... Uh, I guess draining or uh, you know worrying than the groan of uh, when, the fan, when when you miss a chance, the other fan goes, "Fucking oh, hell, good man!" Or fucking hell, Elvis. So you you know that you've got a shelf life of missed opportunities. So when when they're going, it's oh fucking hell, thank God for that. It's bought me a bit of time um, to hopefully you know get a few more and, or, or just ride a little bit of a, a you know a misfire as well. So yeah, great. Great day, you know, you know. I think we, we was in a good spot into the new year. Team was strong. We we were playing some good stuff. Yeah, and so we made the playoffs again. Frustration, uh, just get destroyed in the first leg away at yeah. Derby. Yeah, uh, again, I, I can't understand. I'm bloody always injured. I'm probably spent a lot of time. Remember, I, I can't. I, I'd had some. I'd had involvement in it. I, I don't really remember or feel like I played. A massive contribution. Yeah. Jamie definitely did. Yeah. Um, and various, I think Dave Mitchell was with us. So different people along the way contributed. I think Terry Herlock might have come back to the yeah, team Herlock at that point was back as well. At that point, um, Pat Van Den Howe, New Emblem yeah. was there. Bruce Murray, Greg Berry. Yeah, that's it. So I was still labouring. I'd had the groin surgery, got back, got back into the team. And this, with this, this guy, Gil, Jerry Gilmore, the surgeon's name was, and he, he's got, he invented this thing, Gilmore's groin. So all footballers got this Gilmore's groin. And you go and see him, and to, to decide whether you've got Gilmore's groin or not, he's got to stick his finger up your nuts. And then if, <laughs> if it's painful, which it generally is, then if it, he says, right, you've got to have surgery now, you've got Gilmore's groin. And it, so he's, he does, but when he does the surgery, he says, don't worry, these, these never go wrong. It's, you have this once, it's, it's done. And you either have a right, the left, or you get both done. But if you get the right done, it's never going to... Anyway, I had the operation, recovered. But then six to eight months later, I'm thinking, this doesn't fucking feel right. I'm laboring again, right? And I was used to wear these, these bottoms underneath my shorts to try and you know, give me some support, whatever else. So, yeah, Derby away, again... I got back into the team. I think Jamie, or, you know, there was a problem that Mick weren't happy with the, with the team. It, it, it wasn't functioning properly. Anyway, so Mick's put me back in and I, I get back in at Derby, but probably wasn't fit enough. And they just got away from us again, 2-0. We didn't play well on the day. Um, we lacked a threat. You know, I, I felt responsible myself. Hadn't functioned properly. The team hadn't. We 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 hadn't laid a glove on them really. Yeah. And then again, I was I think I was sub for the for the return leg. Um, they were better than us. If it, the truth was, uh, over yeah. the two games, they were better. You know, they had the, the, the stronger team. I think for the, for that for that occasion. So, did you did you still with a club the following season? I did. I, 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 and that's I did the pre-season. Got yeah. myself right. Um, and was in a really good place. Scored ten goals. Uh, by October yeah. um, that following season so that following season I became I felt the, the wow. right the main man now I've got now I'm, I'm fit I'm strong um, I'm a bit of a reference point for the team I felt Jamie 
Jamie got sold to Watford. Morley yeah. went to Watford. So I think it was me and Dave Mitchell up front, actually. And, and Dave was a good foil. You know, he was a grafter. He was good in the air. In a great career. Um, I didn't realise, I say, when I, yeah. at the time when I was a kid, you don't, look, you don't have Wikipedia then. And I thought, who's this guy? Really, uh, yeah, he was all right, but he didn't score loads of goals. Looking back now, he had a hell of a career. He did. He played for some good teams. Played across different nationalities or different mm. countries, sorry, as well. Different leagues. Um, you know, and so, yeah, I, the, the team wasn't, we, I think Tony McCarthy come in at centre-back, you know, he's getting younger again, he's leading more on youth, we, you know, Alex was still around, Kenny was still around, Ben Thatcher was now established. 94, 94, 95 it was, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's it, that's it. And so, I'd got it right, and I think, I don't know, I was scoring regularly, like I say, got, got to 10 goals early on, and knew that probably, I'm going to get a move now. This is going to be the time to get the move, and, um, it was, it was, remember the agent who I'd mentioned, he, he, he rang me and said, John, I need to meet you at the Black Prince. Uh, things are happening. The club need money. Bexley, uh, Bexley. That's it. Bexley. So we're going. That's literally done. Yeah. <laughs> go and meet him after training. He said, right, uh, Wimbledon. He said, Mick McCarthy don't even know this yet. Wimbledon have agreed a fee. Um, you're going to go to Wimbledon. There's a chance Kenny Cunningham's going to come with you, but don't worry about that. You're, you're going. It's, it's a done deal. Uh, you'll get a phone call tonight from Mick, right? So I'm thinking, well, I've just trained today. Mick ain't said nothing. Anyway, go on. Then the phone rings like that evening. It's Mick. <laughs> Elvis, it's Mick. Uh, are you sitting down? Uh, we've agreed a fee for Wimbledon. They're gonna, they want you to go around their house or go to Sam Man's house and discuss fees, right? Discuss, discuss, discuss the contract. If you've got an agent, he'll know what to do. Anyway, then John Mack rings, the agent rings up. Right, meet you. Uh, meet me here. We'll t- I'll take to Sam and Mam's house. Right, so me and Kenny jump in his car. We go to Sam and Mam's house and negotiate a contract. And, and Sam lives in St John's Wood, this lovely house. And he sits. Stay, we in, we introduce us to Joe Kinnear and the, the secretary Dave Barnard, I think. And, and Sam's there. And they 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 got the agent sits downstairs and they talk by me. And me and Kenny are upstairs having a beer and watching football, whatever, in, in his house, right? And then John, the, the agent comes out and he goes, right, that's it, we're going. He says, we're going to go downstairs, whatever they say to you, don't say nothing, but we're leaving. He, we, you know, I, was, I was like, okay, what's happened? He said, not doing it, deal's not done. So we go downstairs, joking here, thank you very much, thanks, Sam. He said, where are you going? He says, oh, I'm not allowed to speak. Like, John's, John's representing me, he's saying it's not, you know, so, so we leave. And then turn up to training the following day, and Mick goes, "What are you doing here?" I said, <laughs> "What the fuck are you doing here?" Yeah. So I said, "Well, I, nothing's agreed." I, and to be fair, Mick, I don't really want to go. I, 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 I don't think this one's for me. And Kenny weren't mad on going. You know what I mean? So between the two of us, we we, we, we want to stay. You know, it, like the, they they'd offered us an increase in our salaries, but it wasn't um, a monumental head turning moment. Do you know what I mean? It was. Yeah. It, it was a, so, anyway, I train, and something's going on in my foot. My foot don't feel right as I'm training, mm-hmm. right? So, I go, so, I don't know what the fuck it was. So, anyway, I go in, and I, I sit on the Pete Melville, the physio bench, and, and, and then Nick comes running in after his fucking head exploding. <laughs> what the fuck are you playing at? He's going, we've got to see you. We need the money. I was, he said, don't start pulling any fast ones saying you're injured, right? You're fucking going like this, <laughs> So I was like, shit, I don't even want to go. So we, we was kind of like the club needed the money. That was the yeah. bottom line, uh, which was a shame. It was good, you know, in terms of uh, we got a move to the Premier League. I, mm. I, I kind of like, I guess demonstrated to myself that, you know, you could, I could do enough to get a club to, to think I'm good enough for a million pound fee or whatever uh, and, and, and to take me in. Now, Wimbledon was a wonderful experience. Don't get me wrong. It, um, it was really challenging uh, to be a Premier League player. And probably, again, like I did with Teddy, I probably needed a team to carry me a little bit for me to learn the art of being a Premier League player. And I played some very good strikers at Wimbledon, Mick Harford, Dean Holdsworth, Effin Cuckoo, Marcus Gale, even, not even, but people like Gary Blissett and, and Andy Clark. I learned a lot of, on all of these guys on the, the art of finishing, you yeah. know, real craft of finishing. Uh, and... It was, it was soul-destroying in some ways because I loved playing at the Den and I loved the style of play. 
I loved it. You know, it was football. It was good football. It was a aggressive, attacking, positive football. And Wimbledon, we trained a facility that was, you know, Richardson Evans, you know, people walking their dogs across the pitches. And yeah. that was fine, but it wasn't the glamour of the Premier League. Uh, you know, the style of play was a real challenge. It was just fight football, you know, and percentage football with some quality within it. Don't get me wrong, but it was very unenjoyable. Every game was physically challenging and a physical battle with not a... The, the joy was the victories against the, the better teams. The, 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 it wasn't it wasn't joyful football, you know, put yeah. it that way. Talking, we didn't mention him actually at any point just until you just did. Kenny Cunningham, mm. he went with you. Did that? What, what was he like, Kenny? Did you get on well before you went to Wimbledon with him? Was it a bit like, look, if you go, I'll go sort of thing? Yeah, we, we, we'd help each other. So, you know, the, the, again, with Kenny, it's, it's, it's a long one, only because I, I first met Kenny the day I signed for Millwall. They, they just returned from Ireland and I'm in Bob Pearson's office and the contract's being drawn up and Kenny comes running up the stairs at the old den, pops in, I didn't see Bob Pearson. Bob goes, oh, by the way, this is John Goodman. And Kenny goes, hey, grand, great to meet you, blah, blah, blah. Gives me a big hug and off we go. And so two 19-year-old kids, different backgrounds, but, you know, we rode the, the, the mill wave together. Lovely, lovely guy, you know, teetotaler, um, would always be on a night out of us, laugh at himself, laugh at us, great sense of humor. My missus and his missus got on famously. Uh, he's godfather to my kids, you know. So, yeah, we go to we go to Wimbledon. It's, as coincidence, we're going together. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's quite yeah. bizarre how that worked out. He, I, I, whether he'd have gone on his own, I don't know. You know, uh, he, he's a strong-minded guy. You know, I mean, he's no he's no pushover kid. So I'm sure he had aspirations of his own career, and, but it was a help because I was aware of the day I. The day I went to Sam's house and signed, I don't think Kenny came with me. I went back to Sam's house, right? And Fashion who's around there, John Fashion, and he's already left and he signed for Aston Villa, but he's still around Sam's house, right? So just having, just, just having a cup of tea. <laughs> On the phone, as soon as I signed, Sam rings up Vinny and says, like, right, Vinny, this is John Goodman. Vinny's like, all right, son, how are you doing? Like, you know, looking forward to working well, with you. He's pulling all the strings, isn't he? He's yeah. pulling all the strings possible. Yeah. So and I've, I'm away, I think, fucking hell, these guys, these are bonkers. You know, I, I, I know we had a great time at Wimbledon, at Mill when I played with Terry Hurlock and Pat Vandenhout and Keith Stevens and Gavin Maguire. There's some tough cookies there, don't get me wrong, you know. But now I'm going in with Mick Arf, <laughs> Vinnie Jones and, 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 a, and a whole new school. So, yeah, it was... But, again, a, a tough exterior, but a warm, warm family inside it. You know, great. And, but I think... We supported each other during, you know, that, that, that adjustment, you know, and, you know, Ken went on to have a, a fantastic career, should be a coach and should be a manager somewhere because his knowledge of the game is outstanding. Um, but he does, I know he does his media work and, you know, probably you know, he enjoys that and enjoys the flexibility that that gives him. But you, I think he should be in the game. In, in my view, I've got, I, I've got strong views, you know, which are not necessarily Kenny's views, but... I think football needs football people in the game, and he's a great football person. You know, and, you know, he's, he's, he, I'm, I'm disappointed that we haven't found a role for him within within that, any any coaching. I think he likes. Him. I spoke to him on the phone the other day. He ran me up. Great character. I never spoke to him before, yeah. but the way he spoke yeah. to him, as if he'd known me forever. And yeah, absolutely. He said, "What day do you want to do?" I said, well, "Whenever it's good for you." He said, "I like have a few rounds of golf, and uh, we we'll do it Thursday." So good luck to him. He's enjoying yeah. himself at least. He is. He's got you know lovely partner. He's got his young young son. You know, he's. He, he, you know, Wimbledon, he was, he was tough because I remember we did a pre-season and, right, we went down to this naval base, the tour point, uh, and, right, we're all having skinheads because that's what they do in the Navy, they have skinheads, all right? So we're going to come back and the whole, when we get the team for everyone's got to have a skinhead. And Vinny came, t turned up with the clippers and you, like, got in line, straight away, number one, done. Mick Harford, everybody done it, right? Kenny refused. And I think, fucking hell, Ken, you're going to take one here, mate. And he was like, I ain't, I ain't doing it. You ain't doing it to me. But I think he was conscious. He was going bald, right? So <laughs> he, he, he probably would have done him a favour because it might have made his hair grow back a little bit stronger. But anyway, he didn't. He didn't. He had left that mop on his hair. But, you know, he was his own man. You know, he could go out yeah, yeah. and he's not drinking. He's not drinking. Whereas I'd be like, you know, with Malcolm Allen, yeah, every 15 minutes we're drinking a pint of lager. That's how it is, you know? Yeah. So yeah, it's a good way to make you say you went on to have a great career at we, uh, Wimbledon. Sorry, not Wigan, and it's it's, <laughs> it's so surprising and refreshing. How many players say I didn't want to leave Millwall? Didn't want to leave. No. Wanted to stay. So 
in the four great years you had there, if you could pick one one memory, one great memory out? For me, it would be my debut. Um, Paul Vale away, uh, New Year's Day, absolutely teeming down with rain. And I really had the dream debut, really. Uh, set up Teddy for his first goal uh, and was lucky enough to score a second. Uh, we won 2-0. So that, yeah, that was a yeah, monumental day for me. You know, real, got home, it's New Year's Day, family are there waiting for you. They've got put a little banner up saying, well done. And, you know, in the old end days, it was, it was the CFAX, you know, they took a picture yeah, of C-Fax. that moment, you know, and it's, yeah... <laughs> I've been, listen, I've just, it's, it's an aside, but I've been very lucky. I've, I've worked back at Millwall with Kenny Jacket, been back to the, the ground many times with, with Dino standing uh, previously. Mm. The, the, it, it's, it's such a warm, welcoming club, you know, that it, it, I think that's what it is. It, it, it's, it's, it's your first love. For me, it's my first love because it's my first club. And so you always have that, that care and affection for, for, for the club. That's brilliant to hear, mate. If you could pick three players to go for a drink with from Millwall, Millwall players, tonight, night out tonight, oh. Chinese and then West End for a few of them uh, cocktails you mentioned. Could you, who would you pick? Three of them. Three year old team. That's hard because, that's hard because there was, there'd be definitely, but I, I, I immediately yeah, thought of them, them beehive days, but no, it'd definitely Rhino. You know, he, 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 he makes, he'd always wear this brown jacket. It was awful, his brown jacket. Like, it's like, Rhino, you look like a bloody, OAP, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, it's just, but he loved it. I think he, he called it because he would have a more drunk he got, the more he'd bounce into things. And so it didn't matter if he spilled beer all down it. So it was just one of them fa- uh, foul sale safe jackets. Andy Roberts, because he was just good fun, you know, and he was, he was almost a sidekick to, 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 to Rhino, really. Um, you know, they, 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 they got on famously together. And then it's a toss up. If I could, I'd have both probably Alex, Alex Ray and, uh, and Malcolm Allen because. There you go. That's your fight. You're, you're the fifth member. Yeah, the yeah. Fifth. yeah. I, I take that because I know they don't drink me. They, 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 they're funnier than me. They're, 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 they're kind of like real. I'd, I'd have a great night, but probably wouldn't remember that much about it. You know, they're, yeah, good, good memories. Brilliant. What are you up to these days, mate? I'm now um, academy manager for MK Dons. I've been uh, lucky enough to be involved in football pretty much since I packed up. You know, I did a sports mm. science degree uh, at 28. Um, and then worked for loads of clubs. Again, great times and, and blessed uh, to work in the games. But I, I enjoy the role of academy manager. It, it, MK Don's quite a unique club. I know it well, having played at Wimbledon uh, and then worked at Wimbledon when we went into administration and all the trauma of the move to Milton Keynes. And I know that... The, oh, yeah, but you've not been a little bit frowned upon there for... Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, 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 I've seen both sides of it, you know. Yeah. I, I, I saw... Listen, it's, 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 it's for another story, really. But basically, what Sam had ended up doing with the club Wimbledon, it was it was it was a bankrupt club, you know. And we ended up having Norwegian owners for some reason, and they couldn't afford to keep sending money over. So the club went bust. I was a member of staff. I was working with you know as, as a sports scientist at the club at the time. We were relieved that someone was able to take the club on, you know, albeit it was far from ideal that the. The authorities enabled him to relocate to Milton Keynes. But I've got to say, Pete Winkleman, as a person, when I met him that first time, was a stand-up guy. You know, absolutely everything he said he would like to achieve, he did. Or it tried to do it respectfully, I suppose, in terms of the history of Wimbledon. But of course, and I think everyone at NK is pretty comfortable and very happy with the success that Wimbledon are having. You know, and it's a hell of an achievement. It's a testament to, to a club of Wimbledon that, to do it twice. Yeah. To rise up and, and win an FA Cup, to be a Premier League team, to then disband effectively and to rise up again and be a football league club, it's, it's enough to, that, that should be a resounding success story without any bitterness or animosity toward MK Dons because it, it, unless you really know the, the, the story behind it, it's, it's not... Uh, it's easy to point fingers without knowing the Yeah, thing. it is. And you know, like I say... It, it, the, the club is is, is pro, pro, progressive. It's forward thinking. It's got you know cracking stadium, great track record of developing players. You know, and I'm you know delighted to be a part of that, and hopefully going to help a few more have careers in the game. That's brilliant, mate. So your Millwall career was um, 
was very popular. It was good. And the fans were you know, up over the moon. He was coming on today. And it's been a pleasure. Right. Mate. Thanks for your time, John. Really appreciate Thank it. Thank you ever so much. I really Top enjoyed man. that. Thank you. Thank you, mate. Cheers.